morning and happy Sabbath to all those in person uh, and all of those online as well. We want to welcome our guests, uh, both, here, both here in the physical and watching online as well. We're so glad you could join us. Uh, our first announcement is that prayer meeting will continue on Wednesdays at 6.20 p.m. The, it will be both online and in person, so you'll be looking forward to that. Uh, the 10 day immersion program by Dr. John Kelly uh, for those needing health recovery is nearly full and what I'm told uh, is at the 20 limit cap, but they still do have a waiting list. So sometimes uh, things do happen to where you're able to fill in where someone uh, used to be and they opted out. So uh, to know more about that and to get involved, please call the church office very soon as they are Closing up, our village school is having a virtual Christmas program that can be viewed both on YouTube and Facebook next Sabbath evening at 6 p.m. Uh, this will be bits of pre-recorded and live uh, presentations interspersed, so you'll enjoy a very nice uh, presentation by the school. Uh, only, only the children and parents are able to be here while the live streaming is being recorded so you can enjoy it from home. Uh, again, that is next Sabbath at 6 p.m. The Montana Mission leaves Thursday morning, and if you have any donations of warm coats, uh, boots, hats, gloves, or scarves, anything you might think that uh, the people might need in cold weather, please donate them by this no later than Wednesday. They need to be able to have it so that they can pack it and ship it off in time. Uh, the trailer will be loaded directly after prayer meeting. And it's at this time that I want to invite Pastor Dennis to give us a special announcement. Thank you. You know, there's a lot of things happening out there in the world in the social media, but there's a lot of things happening in the world as the Spirit of God is moving on individuals' lives. Every once in a while, I'll get an email from the Ellen White Estate, and just received one on November 30th, talking about how many people are coming to the website and downloading books and other items and study material. It goes on to say here, just this past week alone, we had 1.25 million visitors who viewed 2.7 million pages and made 46 million search queries on E.G. White Writings website and apps. In addition, last week, users downloaded 650 terabytes of data from 7.2 million audiobook and book download requests. Our servers delivered a staggering, now I wanna see how many hands go up when I mention this word, this term, 2.5 petabytes of data. How many people know what a petrobite is? All right. A petrobite is a thousand gig or a thousand terabytes. So our servers delivered a staggering 2.5 petrobytes of data to 27 million global user requests this past month. Now they go back and they compare this to November 2016. In November 2016, they had a weekly average of 7,500 7, people visiting their site. Now they have 1.25 million people visiting. All right. In November of 2016, this, they served just 45 gigabytes of data. Now they're putting out 2.5 petabytes of data. I want to encourage you to visit the site. I want to encourage you to invite others to visit. I want to encourage you to think about how you can support the Ellen White Estate because they're at a point now where they need our support more now than ever. God's moving mightily, friends. Let us walk with him and follow along and not lag behind. Praise the Lord for what he is doing. And the other thing I would say it is another praise, as many of you know, that last week I mentioned we're going down to Brazil here in a couple weeks, 
and there's four people ready for baptism, and I was just told the other day there's two more ready now for baptism, amen? And so these food baskets that we're raising money for for Brazil, you can still partake of that, and you can either visit their website, globalthinkers.com, uh, .org, or you can visit us here at the Village Church and donate and mark your tithe envelope, Brazil food baskets. This is going to help draw people into the gospel ministry as we share with them. Thank you. Can you say amen? Thank you, Pastor Dennis, for that encouraging update. Uh, there will be a blood draw here on Tuesday from 1 o'clock to 7 p.m., so please consider uh, if you're willing and able and eligible to give uh, this gift of life, consider what it will mean to someone in our area. So to sign up, go to the website listed in the bulletin or call the church office uh, on Monday. For further announcements, please check your bulletin. You'll find them in uh, the second page on the inside, and you'll see more about that also on the back as well. Village member Lydia Blosser has passed this week. She was 99 years old, and she taught here uh, in the church Sabbath school many years ago, and she moved into home care next door about a year ago after 10 years of declining cognitive ability due to dementia. So let's please remember to keep uh, her, her uh, two boys in your prayers and also her family as well as they go through this tough time. Uh, again, remember to please practice social distancing and to visit outside in the fresh air, uh, particularly not in the building. We want to continue to be able to uh, worship as we have been, so we want to ask that you please uh, respectfully cooperate in that. And we will now transition to our worship service, so let us prepare our hearts. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. Would you bow your heads, please, for prayer? Dear Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house this morning with our brothers and sisters. We thank you for the freedom that we can be here and worship you. We ask that you be in our minds, in our hearts, and help us to understand the things that are taught this morning and, and live our lives for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our song this morning is number 340. <laughs> Thank you. 
such a wonderful Sabbath where we get to sing praises to God, sing about how he does save us. This morning we're going to travel back into time where we can pretend that we're outside the stable where Jesus was born. Let's sing a few Christmas carols this morning, starting with Away in a Manger. Jesus born and to be able to shout it from the mountaintops to tell everybody that our Savior Jesus was born. Sing with us, go tell it on the mountain.
so wonderful how God knew the beginning to the end and that he planned the special time when Jesus did come into the manger because he is our Savior, he is the King, he is the one that loves us no matter what. So let's finish by singing, Silent Night, Holy Night. Well, boys and girls, I have a story to share with you this morning. Many of you go to school, and I bet your favorite time of the day is lunchtime, right next to recess time. That's pretty important, too. Well, I'm going to tell you a story about some boys who always went to eat their lunch outside by the swing set. They took turns swinging on the swing while they were munching on their sandwiches or sipping on their apple juice. And there was one little boy named Bobby who always ate his lunch on the side of the school building. Well, the group of boys noticed that Bobby ate every day beside the school, and they got to talking. Why does Bobby always eat his lunch 
on the side of the building where nobody can see him. Well, they thought, well, maybe Bobby has some good things in his lunch that he doesn't want anybody to see. Or maybe Bobby doesn't bring much at all. Maybe, they said, we should sneak inside Bobby's lunch and see what it's all about. They knew that Bobby was always in his seat in the morning by the first bell, and they had three minutes in between the first and second bell to peek inside Bobby's lunch. So the next day, when the first bell rang, sure enough, Bobby was in his seat ready for school to start. And the other boys, they snuck over into Bobby's lunch and they pulled it out and they said, let's see what's inside. So they opened it up and guess what Bobby had in there? He had a potato and that was all Bobby had to eat. Well, that's not very much. If you had a potato in there, you'd be thankful for that potato, but you sure would be glad if there was something else in there. So that's probably why Bobby went to the side of the school so nobody could see him eating his potato. Well, some of the boys started snickering and said, you know what, let's play a trick on Bobby. Let's trade out his potato for a rock. That way, we'll just see him on the side and we'll laugh at him. That's not very nice at all, is it? Well, at lunchtime, the boys waited on the side and at the swing set because they knew Bobby was going to get his lunch and he was going to go to the side. So they kind of peeked over to see. Well, Michael had gone to the office earlier that day and guess what Michael did? <gasps> Well, when Bobby opened his lunch, inside was a juice box. <gasps> Wait a minute, I thought there was supposed to be a rock in there. <gasps> the boy's jaws dropped when he pulled out a banana. There wasn't a banana in there in the morning. <gasps> out. He kept pulling out. <gasps> Some yummy pretzels were in there. <gasps> what else was in there? A peanut butter and jelly sandwich was in there. The boys were shocked. The rock, for some reason, had turned into other food. <gasps> And fruit snacks. Who doesn't like fruit snacks in their lunch? Oh, that's the best part. <gasps> well, guess what? Michael knew that it was more important to give his lunch to Bobby than to sit there and laugh at him. Jesus wants us to do kind things to others. He doesn't want us to trick people and make them sad. Don't you get excited when you're outside playing and you come inside and mommy just bakes some chocolate chip cookies and they're still warm? <gasps> mommy and daddy's love to give to you. Grandma and grandpa's love to give to you. And it's getting close to Christmas time where we give gifts. Do you know why we give gifts? because Jesus gave us the greatest gift of all. He gave us his life. So let's think about how we can be like Jesus and like Michael and give beautiful gifts to others so that we can bring joy to them all year round. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, come and live in our hearts today. Help us to be more like you and to be a light that shines to the whole world. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. To those who are worshiping with us online, we thank you very much each week, each month, for your support in prayers and also contribution. You can still go online at villagesda.org and support this mission. What we have here at Village Church 
that is worth your sacrifices, your prayers, and your dedication? Answer is, having God as your business partner systemically, consistently, and faithfully. Why? Because the dedication of our outstanding pastor and the pastoral staff and also the leaders is re retaining and maintaining good leaders here at God's Church. Reflecting in each week, each two weeks, each month that you return faithfully your tithe and your offering for the cause of God's work. Second, our local congregation here at Village Church is involved in missionary work such as Montana, El Salvador, the Amazon, the Lifestyle Immersion Program coming up, yet you are faithful as vessel of Christ in a stormy sea. As we prioritize our time, our resources, our talents, and our money for God's service, remember these two things. This mission is for us to share. The reward is also for us to share. Please take and step forward. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly home. Praise God, the Son and Holy Ghost. Father in heaven, before thy presence are the living stones laid together to make one solid building, your church, your people. You have ordained us to assume our divine proportions before the world, and we thank you, Lord, that these stones can emit light as we are your workmanship. Lead, let thy will be done in the lives of those who are, were able to give today and those who were not. I pray for divine ministrations as you did for Daniel. As we give you a portion of blessing through the tithe and offering that thou hast bestowed upon us as part of this church to advance the purity and the knowledge from light to light and glory to glory. We lift before you this sacrifice, Lord, 
this tithe and offering as we give to you in the abundance of blessing that you have given to us. Here are your people. We want to be the court of the holy life, filled with varied gifts, endowed with the Holy Spirit as we find happiness of the city on the hill. As this part, Lord, heaven is watching, and we thank you for the blessing. We thank you for the sacrifice. Please accept our response to your loving and your care for us. Bless their hearts as they willingly give to you. For this we humbly ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Good morning. I'd like to invite Rhonda Johnson and David Mann to join me here. You know, uh, Pastor Kenny just talked about in his prayer our church assuming the divine proportions that it should have in this world. And uh, years ago, back in 1959, something started in the Seventh-day Adventist Church that was revolutionary. It was called the Five-Day Plan to Stop Smoking. It began five years before the Surgeon General would tell us that smoking was even bad for you. Okay, so that means for five years leading up to that, nobody would say that. You know, science is not everything some people make it out to be. There are moments when science is either out in front the wrong way or lagging behind in the wrong way. We had at some places over a thousand people come out for those five-day plans. This church is to be the head, not the tail. And we are in a position right now where I believe God's giving us an opportunity uh, some of you may not know this, but at the beginning side of the COVID experience, the state of Indiana was giving a certification with one and a half days worth of training. And that certification was to assist in the medical fields, probably with things like CNA work, etc. As I was listening to that one morning on my radio, I'm thinking to myself, we need to come up with a way where we can create some credibility for what we're doing with methods that actually are proven physiologically. Wouldn't you know it, a little later this year, Dr. John Kelly, uh, who is a founder of the American College of Preventive Medicine, came here during Camp May, visited with me, and offered himself to participate with us in initiating a training module that will both bless people and train others so that we can have a credibility that comes in this age of uncertainty. Rhonda Johnson is not only our treasurer, but she is very keenly interested in the ministries of this church, health ministry being one of them. Tell us a little bit about what's happening. We have this immersion program and this training program coming up. What's happening? Both programs are full, but we are still taking names in case somebody needs to drop out for one reason or another, so still feel free to call into the church office. You can talk to Tony or myself, and we'll put you on the list. And we're also looking for volunteers, hydrotherapists, massage therapists, people to do laundry for all the towels that are going to be used during hydrotherapy. We have bookkeeping works that needs to be done and kitchen work. And so if you're interested and have any time to spare, give us a call. And so we'll be doing this the... Starting February 1. February 1. Through February 19. Okay, so that kind of includes the training module for those that are actually going to be trained under Dr. Kelly. And then a few days into that, the immersion starts. So we have 20 people signed up for the immersion, and we have 15 people 15 signed people up for the, the training. The training. <laughs> okay, good. It wasn't cheap, no. and it's not cheap to run this program. So we're That's not right. out to make money. But, but it is a good price compared to if you go to... Well, it's like a fourth <laughs> of what you'd pay somewhere right. else. So we're trying to do a professional program, and we have to have a little bit of money to do it. And so what we're trying to do is offer something that really could be done. We are offering scholarships to some folks, but that phase is pretty much closed. And uh, we do have a waiting list, and it's possible if you're on that list, you could still be involved. But if you want to volunteer, you could still be a part of assisting in, in a variety of ways. So call the office, get a hold of you or Tony, and uh, we're anticipating something pretty exciting. It takes twice as many people to put on this program as the participants. <laughs> okay. Well, that's probably how it is in a lot of things. Yeah. You don't see all the behind the scenes. Right. So, but you're, you're, the health ministries team is working very closely together. Mm -hmm. Good spirit, excited about what's going on, lots of volunteers. We still need some more. So it's going to be a, an amazing event. So praise the Lord. Now, David, you joined this. You, you are a very uh, organized individual and missionary-minded person. And we had a conversation the other day, and you were open to becoming 
in partnership with Dr. Kelly and our health ministries team, the program director for this event. Tell us a little bit what's on your mind. Well, I was so, thank you. Uh, I was so thrilled to join this team as a program director. It's such a wonderful team working with Pastor Kelly, Dr. Kelly and Rhonda and the health ministries uh, team. Um, we had a meeting on Thursday night and we uh, were looking forward to having a wonderful event. Um, to add on to what Rhonda said, uh, if you do have any interest in volunteering, we really do need some more volunteers, particularly in massaging and um, the hydrotherapy. Uh, so let us know if you have training in that, and we will work with you. Um, we're so fortunate to have so many people in this experience who are dedicated to the mission of, uh, of health uh, of health, and they're, they're willing to work on missionary wages and, and to volunteer their time, and we're so fortunate to have so many people who are dedicated to this amazing experience, to making people healthier, and uh, as Ellen White has said so clearly, this is the right arm of the gospel. This shows people that we care, but beyond that, we have to realize the body and the mind are, are one. And if the body is feeling good, it's going to make the spiritual side happier too. Amen. So we were in staff meeting this week, and I was saying with Pastor Jonathan, you know, we need to get that ad over to the Lake Union Herald, and Rhonda pipes up and says, there's no more room, so there's no need to send the ad, so we saved a little bit of money. So uh, you like saving money, don't you, Rhonda? Right. So do I. Folks, I want you to be praying. I really truly believe there are hundreds if not thousands of other churches in this division and around the world that could do this kind of ministry. I believe there are other doctors and nurses and physical therapists that could commit themselves to learning these things and reinvigorate the right arm of the gospel, the health message in our denomination. We can be the head, not the tail. But it's going to require a completely different level of commitment. It's not an act of convenience. It's an act of consecration. So this morning, you may not be able to do very much. You may not think you're gifted in anything. You might come out the other side of this with a few more gifts than you imagined. If you have a spirit to help and you have a little extra time, this is an intensive program. Dr. Kelly's committed basically the first three weeks of, Febtem of uh, February to be here. And all these volunteers between trying to squeeze this in, t some taking uh, time off for work, and of course some of these practitioners uh, we have to give a missionary wage to because they're missing out on money where they need to be making money other places. But this is not a money-making program. It's a ministry. It just so happens that it's going to take a little bit to do it. We're not asking you to donate to it. Uh, we are asking you to pray for it. And if you have a willingness to help, that would be fantastic. I want to ask God's blessing on the health ministry team and two representatives of that team right here and Dr. Kelly. So I invite you to bow your heads as I pray for this ministry. Lord, I thank you for what you do. You just keep giving us opportunities to achieve the successes you intended for Old Testament Israel and you intend for New Testament Israel. And so now, Lord, I'm asking that you'll bless Rhonda and David and the health ministries team. Bless Dr. Kelly as he has this heart to do this, he could retire and live comfortably. Instead, he desires to bless humanity and win souls. May we all partner together. I pray move on the hearts of other uh, health care providers. Uh, thank you that you've said when we seek first your kingdom, you'll add everything else to us. So help us not to be afraid, but help us to move forward, Lord, trusting that if you prompt and you convict, you will guide and you will provide. Thank you now. Bless this ministry as we head towards February, and may we come out the other side, Lord, so thankful for what you've done in us and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you both. God bless you, and we will continue with the service. Today I'll be reading Daniel 1, 1 through 10. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land, of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles. Young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, 
possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them for a daily provision of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel in his heart, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come to you and recognize you again as our savior, as our protector, our provider, And we thank you for the opportunity, for the unbelievable blessing it is to meet with you and to receive from you the blessings that you have in store. We confess our need, we confess our sins. And we ask for and receive the forgiveness, the cleansing, the covering that you have promised. And we say thank you. Father, it is abundantly clear that the nation, the world around us, is becoming increasingly chaotic, confused, uncertain, and even dangerous. Father, we are so thankful that we can come here to this place. I thank you that you have given the courage and wisdom to Pastor Ron and other pastoral leaders here to open this church that we can come here and be together. The division, increasing division that we see in our world is the exact opposite of what you call us to be and do. To unify in love to have agape, unconditional love for one another. Father, please help us to have this experience more and more. Now and in the days going forward that we may together accomplish the task that you have given to us. Help us to love one another. Help us to love those on the other side in all of the divisions that take place. Help us to love everyone and to point them to you as our certainty, as our surety, and as our Savior. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
such a special day when a little baby is born. I've had the privilege of having four little babies myself, and you start out with naming the first name and their second name, and as time goes on, their little personalities develop, and they have other nicknames that they get, and it's such a, a special time, and how special it would have been to be Mary and to know that your little baby was going to be king of the world. And so as we sing this song, Jesus Born on This Day, you can hear the different names that were given to baby Jesus. you singers for reminding us of the light that's come into this world. We don't want to reject that light. May God guide us as we make this journey. Nice to see you all here today. Let's ask God to bless us as we open the word. Father, thank you that we live in a free society, 
that we have the opportunity for proclamation and praise. I'm asking, Lord, that you'd make us good citizens, humble, teachable. May we do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. May we be the salt in a society that preserves. May we be light as we let you be reflected in our lives. And now bless us as we open the word in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I'm coming to the close of a series entitled Risk and Redemption. I want to remind you just a little bit of what the, the preaching or homiletical journey in this church has been since COVID. Hard to imagine that for seven months now, uh, actually just a little bit more, we have found ourselves uh, worshiping in unique circumstances and not worshiping for a few months as well. In the beginning, uh, at least we weren't worshiping together. In the beginning, most churches across the nation, including in this state, including of this denomination and this conference, we closed for a while. And after about two months, there was a sense that this was manageable and that we needed to get back on with life. So on the first Sabbath in June, this church opened back up, and that brings us up to today where we are managing in the midst of a continuing COVID element. To say anything less than to say our society has been COVID-defined right now would be a false statement. The question I have for you this morning is, how COVID-defined should our society be? This is really the issue. I'm going to look at the life of Daniel as an old man, going into the potential death of crushing by the jaws of lions. Before I do that, I'm going to create a challenge, and I know I'm going to create it. I think it's my job sometimes to create it, but I'm careful. I don't pass on much information. I don't see myself as the ultimate sieve with the ultimate discretion. At the same time, this moment, for those of you that are gathered here and for those that will watch, is a portal through which some measure of responsibility and opportunity do exist. I weigh those things out very carefully. I've stood in this pulpit before, and, and before I've gotten to the pulpit, I've heard elders say things that are nothing less than divine prompts for the preacher, and they don't know it. And this morning, while I was back here listening one of our elders said something that prompted me. Last night, I had an elder send me something after I had gone to bed. They sent me a text, suggested I look at something. I had another elder point something out to me this week, and I had another elder before him. And pretty soon, the preacher, hopefully, can be wise enough to discern that God is shepherding the process. So I'm going to do something that will be potentially controversial, but that's okay. Truth is always to be found for those who want to find it. And if something I say is wrong, I want somebody to show me. I am not out to create a narrative. I'm not out to attack a narrative. I'm out to create a path where light shines and people can move with some measure of freedom and liberty. So, listen as a Berean and check it out yourself. If you go to the Berean County COVID dashboard, you can find some interesting statistics. Now, because our society is COVID-defined, it is my understanding of watching things happen, that we're seeing the societal ramifications or results of a consumer mindset on the lives of people. Consumers open their mouth and producers pour it in. Consumers are receivers. Consumers have expectations. Consumers are not risk takers. 
Consumers are at the top of the consuming pack. So why am I spending this time? Because I am confident that the lever of the final apocalyptic attack on God's people is built around nothing more and nothing less than fear. And that's why this morning I'm going to do this in the last of seven sermons on the life of Daniel. I'm going to interject into the dialogue something for you to pursue and think about, something for you to pray about, something for you to wrestle with. If you go to the Bering County COVID dashboard, you'll learn these facts. This is the county where this village church is located. That to as close a date as reportable, 7,432 people have either had confirmed or probable cases of COVID. That's out of 154,000 people. Of those 154,000 and the 7,000, almost 500, that have some verifiable likelihood of having COVID, 116 people have died. And this is sad. That makes the death to population seven one hundredths of one percent. Now, I'm going to tell you your likelihood of dying based on your age category. I'm going to give you the statistics for this county. There have been 70 deaths out of the 116. That's 60 percent. 70 of those deaths have come from people in the age group 80 years of age or older. I look out, there's some of you in that age category here today. It's good to have you. You've been here many Sabbaths. 26 deaths, or 22%, are from the age 70 to 79. There's more of you here in that category. 13 deaths, or 11%, come from ages 60 to 69, and four deaths in the category I'm in from 50 to 59, three deaths in 40 to 49, and not one single person under 40 has died in this county from COVID. Now, these are not things I've manipulated. There are seven people in our hospital system in ICU with COVID and 67 in the general ranks, right there on the COVID dashboard. This morning, these were provided to me by one of our elders, a very careful and thoughtful person. Now I'm going to move to another document provided to me by another elder, although not an elder in this church. This one is from the John Hopkins newsletter, November 26, 2020. It's entitled, A Closer Look at U.S. Deaths Due to COVID. Very interesting article done by a master's student, a graduate student at John Hopkins. She came across some data which does not fit the narrative. And when I say the narrative, I mean the messaging that tends to make us afraid. Now, I do believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that this disease exists and we should be very careful. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that you should make a wise, prayerful, informed decision about how you circulate in public. I do believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that public gatherings should engage a measure of caution and carefulness. I do believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that if you have a core morbidity and you are an aged person, your risk factor, science shows it, very high. And I'm also convinced after looking at this article, again, brought to me by somebody I exceptionally respect, that we ought to get the full story when we're making our decisions so that we can do it. And you say, that sounds conspiratorial. I have said so many things about conspiracy in the last several months and years that it would be difficult for someone to adequately build a case against me of being a conspiratist. So, since I'm not a conspiratist, and since I believe facts matter, 
I'm sharing this with you this morning because it appears to me to be a fact. And it doesn't matter to me whether it goes along with someone's narrative or not. If it's a fact, it is a fact. This master's degree student studied the data from the CDC for the last six years. And in looking at the data from the Centers for Disease Control, she discovered something that surprised her. From mid-March to mid-September, U.S. deaths have reached a total of, how many people die in a period of time from March to September? How many people die in America every year from March to September? Well, this year, 1.7 million people died of which 200,000 or 12% of total deaths are COVID-19 related. Now, when I first read this article, I didn't really notice the word related, but I'm noticing it right now. 200,000 or 12% of total deaths are COVID-19 related. Instead of looking directly at COVID-19 deaths, Brian focused on total deaths per age group and per cause of death in the U.S. and used this information to shed light on the effects of COVID-19. After retrieving data on the CDC website, Brian compiled a graph representing percentages of total deaths per age category for early February to early September, which included and includes the period before COVID-19 was detected in the U.S. to, to after its infection rates soared. Surprisingly, The deaths of older people stayed the same before and after COVID-19. Since COVID-19 mainly affects the elderly, experts expected an increase in the percentage of deaths in older age groups. However, this increase is not seen from the CDC data. In fact, the percentages of deaths among all age groups remain relatively the same. The reason we have a higher number of reported COVID-19 deaths among older individuals than younger individuals is simply because every day in the U.S., older individuals die in higher numbers than younger individuals. Brian also noted that 50 to 70,000 deaths are seen before and after COVID-19, indicating that this number of deaths was normal long before COVID-19 emerged. Therefore, according to Brian, not only has COVID-19 had no effect on the percentage of deaths of older people, but it has also not increased the total number of deaths. Now, I have in my hands at this very moment as I speak to you something you can look at for yourself. I have a graph that maps all the leading causes of death for six years. And so you've got heart disease, and you've got lung issues, and you've got influenza, and you've got all these things grafted around here, and you can see they go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's seasonal. And then you come to March of this year, and something unique happens to this graph, and you can't see it from where you're at. All of those data lines start going down. And there's a reason. They all start going down, and there's another graph here that describes how many less people are registered as cause of death as heart disease, chronic respiratory, Alzheimer's, diabetes. Almost all of these numbers plunge. And that's because when a person dies with a comorbidity, the comorbidity is not recognized as a contributor to death, only COVID-19 which means that while COVID-19 may have precipitated death, it was not the underlying true cause of the death. And so if you have, if you have dynamics of heart disease, congestive heart failure, and you get COVID, you'll be listed as dying from COVID even though it was the congestive heart failure behind the scenes that had really set you up for your final days. Now, none of this was going to be recognized until this lady did her research, and then all of a sudden you see there are not, there is no spike in deaths in America. Why does it matter to me? 
Because as this, as this article points out, she says, this comes as a shock to many people. How is it that the data lies so far from our perception? Now, I want you all to think about that. How is it that the data lies so far from our perception? Now, why spend the time? Because there are people, I had somebody mention it to me yesterday. There are people who are deathly afraid that this is going to get them. And if you have a comorbidity, this might be the journey that brings our lives to an end. But the idea as a follower of Christ of living in fear is completely contradictory to the things he asks us to do, which will create fear if we don't have a sense in the living presence of a living God who sends us on living messages, living journeys with living messages for dying people. If ever there were divine birth pangs going on on the face of the planet, let us not forget that COVID-19 is the first global birth pang in many of our lifetimes. And I think some of us have given up an awareness of what that means. But if it is a global birth pang, it means that global deliverance is on its way and that the baby of deliverance born 2,000 years ago will come back as the Lord of life and destiny and eternity. And everybody ought to know who that precious little bundle of light was who was plopped down into this cesspool of darkness. If ever there was a time for the church to be about its business, it's now. But in the name of misunderstanding and good science, some would think that wrong engagements, and yes, some wrong engagements could be presumptuous, but some would think that engagements in the name of Christ are ancillary. They're, they're out on the periphery of importance. They're not central and centered in the organized efforts of God's people. Now, as I was listening to Pastor Ramoni, I heard references to some things that matter to me. Writing in the Review and Herald, December 4, 1900, December 4, the church on earth is God's temple, and it is to assume divine proportions before the world. Did you catch that phrase when he used it? Divine proportions before the world. Well, I want to know, what does a divine proportion look like? Does it mean a little bit less, a little bit less until we're gone? Or do divine proportions look more like the expanse of the cosmos? Do they look more like the massive mountains? Since Daniel interpreted a dream where a, a stone smites all the images of this earth and grows into a mountain, I suspect that divine proportions on a little earth look pretty big. But I want to know, who are we to suggest otherwise by lives of convenience? I'm going to skip an awful lot of it, and I'm going to come down to the last paragraph. The church is God's fortress, his city of refuge, which he holds in a revolted world. And this sentence ought to rivet our attention and challenge our lives. Any betrayal of her sacred trust, talking about the church, is treachery to him who's bought her with the precious blood of his only begotten son. What does a betrayal of sacred trust look like? Does it mean the casual closing of institution after institution? Does it mean uh, the reckless pursuit of pleasure while acts of duty and the work of the army of Christ, which ought to be the metaphor we're using for the church? is exceptionally poor choice because we're so loosely connected and loosely organized we could never be an army. Are we supposed to roll over and play dead in hopes that the devil will pass by? We may expect from the history that is given us of Daniel that God will work for us as he did for Daniel. 
Daniel purposed in his mind that he would not comply with any condition that would in any way weaken his physical powers. Now, if he had yielded to that very first test and eaten at the king's table, then he would have yielded to the second test. Had he said, it's a very small matter whether I pray in secret, take your bulletins out. This is in your bulletin. Let's read it together. Get your bulletins out. Seeing it will be better than just hearing it. Now, I took a few sentences out for the bulletin, so if I read something that's not in your bulletin, you'll know why. Had he said, it's a very small matter whether I pray in secret or whether I pray openly to God and it is convenient for me to obey the commandment, then the Lord could not have let his blessing rest upon him in such a remarkable way. But here is where in Daniel saw God could be honored and that he as a representative of God must keep the living word exalted above all the one who could give wisdom and power, as the one who could give wisdom and power. Here was an opportunity for him to show to all from whence came his strength and that man could not become between him and God. Therefore, he did not accommodate himself to the circumstances at all, but he placed himself in the position that he would lose his life rather than dishonor the God of heaven in any way. And we see that God honored Daniel with wisdom and, and understanding more than all the astrologers and magicians that were in the king's palace. And notwithstanding, a gaping lion's den was open before him, yet he would repair to his tent and worship God there. Now, the next paragraph's not there few sentences, not too long. Now here is where the test is coming to all who will enter the city of God. Whether they will keep God's commandment and his honor before them, or whether they will serve the powers that be. And if our people shall take the position that their faith is a convenient faith, that's the second time I've read that word, and that it can be manipulated according to their convenience, that's the third time I've read that word, why then will... Why then will they throw themselves on the side of the enemy? Take your Bibles and open them up to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, headed for the den. Daniel chapter 6. This is a most interesting story. We have a 62-year-old new Persian king by the name of Darius who is on the throne. He will have a brief kingship but there is one who has had a long journey as a statesman. His name is Daniel. He was prematurely put on the shelf by Belshazzar and not wanted. And he's brought out of retirement by this new king. He's in his 80s. He is an old man. And yet God has given him vigor and ability to serve and something even more important. It seemed good, verse 1, to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom and that they would be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over the three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these three satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. In other words, he's looking for somebody who will care like he cares, and do as he would do. Then Daniel began to distinguish himself among the commissioners and the satraps because he possessed an extraordinary or excellent, your version may say, spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Now, whether or not the plan comes into being or not, others know that it's being considered. And Daniel's life is so beautifully different. Could you hear me, friends? Beautifully different. What creates an extraordinary or an excellent spirit? I'm going to explain to you what it is. What creates this extraordinary or excellent spirit is the heart of a Christian to love like God loves. Listen to what Ellen White writes. She says, appropriate duties are assigned by heaven to the church on earth, and the members are to find their happiness and the happiness of, in the happiness of those whom they help and bless. Is that how you live? You're just working for a paycheck? I feel sorry for you. I don't care where you work. It doesn't matter to me if you're flipping impossible burgers at Burger King or whether or not you're doing molecular uh, biological studies at, at Eli Lilly. The truth of the matter is, wherever you work, you're to work serving for a higher order, and that is 
to find your joy in loving and blessing the people around you. So if you're mowing grass, mow it better than anybody else. And no matter what you're doing, do it a notch above because you care, not because you're biding your time to get a paycheck. Christ actually calls us to be just like Daniel, which is how credibility gets its first connection. Daniel was distinguished not because there weren't other smart people and other gifted people, but because the presence of Christ in his life created an element, an atmosphere of person that stood out above the rest because he genuinely cared about everybody. His boss, his co-workers, I believe he genuinely cared even about the connivers that wanted to take away his life. And if you're not living like that and you learn at home, if you can't go to the dish sink and put your hands in the soapy water on behalf of a ministry to the family, well, you're missing out. The truth of the matter is, is that God's calling you to find your happiness in blessing and serving others. But in a, in a consumer society, that's not how we're taught to think. The guy with the money is the one who gets served. The gal with the finance is the one who gets the best service. But the church of God is different and the people of God are different. Are you willing and wanting to be that kind of person? That's where we're at. And without that kind of credibility, you won't be easily distinguished from the rest of the smart people. Because Daniel was not only gifted mentally, Daniel was gifted with a love for lost people. And he knew it in the old kings and he knew it in the new one. And he was far beyond the years of being impressed with the pomp and circumstance of royalty. He'd seen the ups, he'd seen the downs, and he knew what was in the heart of man, just like Jesus. And this man came to his work with a different spirit. No wonder the king wanted to honor him. He was a man probably about a generation older than the king, and what a trusted advisor. Now, I want to ask yourself, what was it that these people had against Daniel? He had something they could have, but getting it is costly. And they didn't have direct line to the living God. And so they simply had what the world could give, and that makes you one who wants to claw and climb your way to the top. Verse 4, the commissioners and satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to the government affairs, but they could find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Praise God and hallelujah if every politician, statesman, and leader of a business could be found to have the same epitaph on their grave when they went to their rest. No selfish ambition, no corruption, no unfaithfulness. You know, when I eat at your house, I hope whoever did the dishes did a really good job because I don't want to find a little speck of the last meal on my plate. That's where you learn it. You learn it when you're young. Teach it patiently, wisely, and kindly. Affirm it when it's done well, parents. The truth of the matter is faithfulness is beautiful and an interest in others is a jewel of adorning character and it's something that God wants. Then these men said, smart men, we're not going to find anything like this. We will not find any ground of accusation against Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. I want to ask you, do your worst enemies know that you are distinctly living for Jesus? Do your coworkers know that you are completely given over to Christ? Does your boss know that God is first and best and most loved in your life? This is the testimony of Daniel. And after they've combed through all the records they have access to, Freedom of Information Act in old time media Persia, they finally say, you know what, guys? This is a losing game. We're going to have to come at this from another angle. And by the way, friends, if you think that corralling the masses for the public interest of man is simply just a coincidence at this time in earth's history, you need to know something. When it's time for the Sunday laws and it's time for the enforcement of the mark of the beast, when we're not only told we ha can't worship in private the way we want, but we must worship wrong, both stories captured in the book of Daniel, it'll be on behalf of the global best interest. And if you don't hear those tones all around you right now, you have to be tone deaf. The Pope is beating this drum very, very loudly. On behalf of the global family, it's not just COVID. It's the demise of our environment. And at some point in time, it'll probably be the demise of our economy. 
And at some point in time, anybody that's not in lockstep with the mantra of man-made salvation will be an enemy of the state. Now, I want to challenge everybody as we come into this. The unwritten portion of the story here between verse 4 and 5 is that everybody knows Daniel is completely a living servant of the living God. If we're not living our lives openly, if we're just meandering through life like a pinball from one pleasure to another, if there's no structure in our life, if accountability and duty never direct what we're doing, we cannot have the freedom, the, the hope, and the power that this old man has. And you don't wait to get it till you're old. You'll find it today. Christ is waiting. He's here to offer it to you now. Will I give Jesus permission to chisel and polish and square me so I can be a living stone in the temple of God, emitting light? We're being asked by God today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Here's Daniel as an older man, and everybody knows, even the king knows, but he's not prepared for the subtlety of the enemies of God. And they come and they say, King, we think this, should, this would go nicely on the books. Never changed. Nobody can worship any god except you for 30 days. And the king reaches into his pocket, and he grabs his quill, and he says, where is that paper? And he signs his name. Now, I didn't think about this in the first service. But you know, Daniel went from minding his own business, praying on the roof three times a day, looking towards Jerusalem. By the way, there's more than one way to pray. Solomon prayed standing up. Eliezer prayed standing up. Paul and many others, Jesus Right, kneeling down, you pray in the right posture for the right experience in the right place in the right time, always with honor and reverence. Daniel goes to his home, morning, noon, and night, David said in Psalm 55, 17. Daniel will not allow the lifeline to be cut. And he goes up onto his rooftop. He goes from minding his own business one day to surveillance state the next. Now, we don't know how many people were posted all around the quadrant of Babylon that he lived in. We do know there weren't all these electric eyes watching with all these databases taking notes digitally. But he goes from minding his own business, doing what he has freedom and privilege to do, to being the focus of attention for evil the very next day. Now, I'm going to challenge all of you, and I'm going to challenge our listeners. There are many who want to beat the drum of Romans 13, 1 and 2, which says you're just supposed to do what you're told and don't make yourself a nuisance to the state. And you know what? That's inspired directive. So what gives with Daniel? Daniel. And what gives with those people in parts of the world where you don't have permission to gather to worship and you sing under the table with several layers of quilts over it? You don't even read out loud. Are there not times and places where the directive of God runs smack dab into the mission and the worship of the living Christ and the reaching of the lost? We are to be broad-minded and intelligent people who have a heart for the ones around them. And that excellence of spirit can't be subdued. It can't be stopped. Ellen White says, the workers of God are aggressive, not timid, not retiring, not convenient. Amen. And yet so much of what's going on in modern Christianity is infected by con consumerism. We have affluenza, affluenza, that we find ourselves moving according to to the dictates of a well-cultivated palate of pleasure and convenience. And it is an affront to God, his betrayal to his cause. The divine proportions are going the wrong direction. And something has to stop before the sun sets on the day of salvation for humanity. God is calling us. And Daniel did not go into the den then. He only goes into the den after the season 
of prayer. They watch. There he is. They've got it on good record. The question I had for you, friends, was Daniel kneeling there, knocking knees and quivering lips and shaking in his boots? Or had this man come to a place where he expected the God of the early years to act in the later years the same way? We may expect from the history that is given to us of Daniel that God would work for us as he did for Daniel. Can you say amen? amen. Listen, live like Daniel, for Daniel's God. Find freedom and power and an open expression of your faith. Follow his convictions wherever they take you when they're in the Word, and don't be afraid. God is calling his people together so the king figures it all out. It's a sad moment. Verse 12, then they, the connivers, approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. Didn't you sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition of any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? Oh, the king's chest swells back up. He looks him in the eye with a big cat's meow smile. The statement is true. According to the law, the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Good, they thought. Then they answered and spoke before the king. One word, and everything changes. Daniel. And all of a sudden, if he could kick himself, Daniel, who's one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you. Pretty slick accusation, isn't it? Was it true? No, it's not true. It's not true that he pays no attention to the king. It's just that his ultimate tension is a little higher. And in this case, the answer is yes. He's not paying attention to that worthless law. And it's not that Christians get to pick and choose. God gets to do the picking and the choosing. So if there is no divine narrative of what we should or shouldn't be doing, then I guess we get to decide. But since the Bible says don't forsake the assembling together or some are in the manner of doing, and since people have been doing it for hundreds of years under threat of death, maybe we shouldn't quit doing it under a 107th percent chance. And maybe it's not okay that the proportions keep getting smaller and smaller and our sense of self-made security keeps getting bigger and bigger. Daniel pays no attention to you or to the injunction which you sign, but he keeps making his petition three times a day as if anybody doubted. I mean, his enemies knew he'd do it. The king's not surprised. And now we have a problem. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply distressed, and he set his mind on delivering Daniel. Man, that's a sweet testimony. King is sucked in by his own hubris, his own ego, his own pride, his own arrogance. He's sucked in. He signs Daniel's death warrant in a statement of his own pride and self-ambition. And when he finds out that's what he did, he's sick. He kept trying to deliver Daniel, and even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. But when the sun went down, verse 15, these men came by agreement to the king. And they said to the king, recognize, O king, that it's the law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. And the king gave the orders. Daniel was brought in, and he was cast into the lion's den. But before we get there, let's hear what the king had to say. The king spoke, and he said to Daniel, now, I'm suspecting this is on the way out to the den, wherever the den was. By the way, something that brings some consternation to archaeologists and critics of the Bible is that they haven't really found any of these dens, but the water table in that part of the world is high enough to where most of them aren't going to be found But we already saw in the study of Daniel 5, no reference to Belshazzar outside of sacred canon. That changed. If this needs to change, it'll change too. Whether it does or not, there was a den. The king walked out to it with him. They dropped Daniel in. There were a few words shared. There was a signet ring of many pressed on the seal of the stone that was there. But this is what the king said, verse 16. He said to Daniel, your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. Now, how many of you were in the read this story 
Get in your mind that picture that's in the Bible story of Daniel standing there in that red and gold robe looking up. There's an angel standing next to him. There's a shaft of light on him. There's a big lion's head in the picture right here and a big male lion going around him right here. I don't doubt for a second that the God who walked with the worthies in Daniel chapter 3 is the God who walks with the ancient man in chapter 6. And where the word angel can be a reference to a literal angel or just to a messenger, it was, it was Darius's idea that God himself was going to get in the game here. And whether he sent an ambassador on his behalf or whether he came down for an old man, Maybe that evening was spent in divine communion physically and personally. The moments in the fiery furnace paled into insignificance with the night in the den, the sun setting on the Persian landscape. All of these men walking out there, they agreed to meet the king. King wasn't going to get out of this. The whole group showed up, the conspirators. And they are all walking out there, and the conspirators are smirking and looking at each other and smiling and raising their eyes on the way out to the den. But the king is a sincere and humble and good man, and what he says he means. And that night when they put Daniel in the den was a night like none other. Stone was brought, laid over the mouth of the den. Verse 17, the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet rings of his nobles so that nothing would be changed in regard to the king. And the king went off to his palace, and he spent the night fasting. That means no food, no entertainment. Some of you are saying no music. And the other thing we know he had was no sleep. So if you have no food, and you have no music, and you have no sleep, maybe the Spirit was there inviting Darius into an encounter of prayer, which is what put Daniel in the den. Maybe on behalf of his friend, petitions were arising in the heart of this king who will call Daniel's God the living God, who will profess amongst all of his worthless nobles, if that word can be rightly applied to them, that he believes God's going to get involved and he's going to be okay, who at the, at the sight of the entrance to the den the next morning will have that den shoved away, that stone shoved away. He'll look down into the darkness of the den and he'll call out in the name of God to see if perhaps God had intervened. What do you do when you wake up in the middle of the night? Leave the TV off. If you want to fall back asleep, read the Bible. It's a very calming book. It's what I like to do. Think about the Word. That night, we will not know till eternity what was going on in the life of Darius, but certainly there was a, a deepening of conviction that Daniel was a man of nobility and integrity. Is that the deepening conviction around you, even when the accusations are that somehow you're a lawbreaker? Might all men know that the men and women of this church are of the noblest, largest-hearted, most generous-spirited people of integrity who are faithful? And that if they choose out of conscientious sake to continue to gather to worship, it is not to thumb their nose at the government of the world or the interest of public health, but that it is in the name of the Lord God that they come together to worship and to pray, to listen and to learn, to study and to share. God is calling His people to be committed with no betrayal of sacred trust so divine proportions can be different and his kingdom can be glorified. It's going to take some risk. There is no progress in dead calm. The salvation of men and the right witness of God will always involve risk. And if you live your life in any other way, you're on the wrong planet. You cannot run away from all the risks. You cannot mitigate all the risk. God has called you to walk in a way like he directed Joshua, don't turn to the left, don't turn to the right. Stay on the narrow road. Nobody will be able to stand against you all the days of your life, and I'll prosper you in everything you do. Psalm 1, don't walk with the scornful. Don't stand in the way of the ungodly. Don't sit in the places you shouldn't sit with the wrong people. That means vicarious as well. What do you mean, Pastor Vicarious? It means don't sit down in front of that device, whatever it is, and do the things you wouldn't do if your parents were there or your wife was there or your husband was there. Walk in the narrow way and don't be afraid. Either there's a real God who delivers his people or it's all a pack of lies. And the sooner you find out, either way, the better. 
God's calling us. Daniel went into that den, and I don't believe he was afraid. He was dropped in carefully by the king's directive, I'm sure. The king arose at dawn, verse 19, at the break of day, and he went in haste to the lion's den. When he come near the den to Daniel, he cried out with a troubled voice. The king spoke, and he said to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you consistently or constantly serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? And the sweetest music comes back to Darius, the voice of his friend. O king, live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the lion's mouth. And they've not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And toward you, O king, I've committed no crime. The king was very pleased. I don't think we can understand how exceptionally jubilant he was. I believe his prayers were answered. He knew Daniel's prayers were answered. And this becomes another king in the litany of witnesses that come out of the lives of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Why? Because they weren't going to bend on principle and they weren't going to bend on practice when it was all about loyalty to God. And when we bend on principle and we bend on practice, when we find conformity to find affirmation, we're going the wrong way. If you have friends that don't love God, make them your missionary interests, but not the ones who shape you through social engagement. God's calling us to come together as a people to encourage and to love. Unless we think the lions weren't hungry, unfortunately, justice, well, unfortunately, justice was meted out on all the conspirators. The Bible says that the lions, before they hit the bottom of the den, were supper. Then Darius wrote the king to all the peoples, verse 25, nations and men of every language who were living in the land. May your peace abound. I make a decree. How many of these decrees are in the Bible? I mean, there's lots of them from Ezra and Nehemiah, from Daniel. I make a decree. Then all the dominion of my kingdom, men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and enduring forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever. He delivers and he rescues and he performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. And you know what? Everybody who got that decree wanted to know how Daniel was delivered from the lions. So, friends, you got to decide. Some of us are making a journey into our dens here on earth, and we're... And it's making us totally unfit and ready for the lion's den. Do you know we're all headed there? If you live to see Jesus come, you'll go through your own version of the lion's den. It's okay. The same God who delivered Daniel? Did my Lord deliver Daniel, the choir sing? Yeah. So is Daniel more special than the end time Daniels? Or is he just a warm up for the final showdown of global controversy? Listen. You can have the assurance of Daniel, and so can I. Just dare to be a Daniel. <laughs> dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose true and live to it principally. Listen, friends, this is no time to just fit into Club SDA. <laughs> Club SDA has some problems. And nobody loves the Seventh-day Adventist Church more than me. At least that's my assessment. But I love it enough to actually let people wrestle with not only what I say, but question me as a person. I don't want anybody's blood on my hands. And I don't want to pastor over a humanly proportioned effort. I want to be a part of something divine. It's coming. I can't stop it. But I and you and anybody who wants to can dare to be a Daniel. 
Listen, many giants, great and tall, are stalking through the land, headlong to their earth would fall if met by Daniel's band. Hold the gospel banner high, on to victory grand. Satan and his host defy and shout for Daniel's band. Dare, but be people of integrity. Don't you dare be like those seven sons of Siva who went to cast out the demons, but their lives were not surrendered to Christ. And the demons said, Jesus we know, and Paul we know, but we don't know you. Walk with Jesus. Have a place of prayer in your home. Eject all of the things that are driving the Spirit of God from your heart. And don't be afraid of the future. God holds the future. And if God holds you, he'll do for us as he did for Daniel. Let's stand and sing our closing calling nobody to the front because we're going to social distance. But I'm not coming to the end of this series without asking you to make some decisions. If the Spirit of God has convicted you this morning, follow Him. If there's things that need to go so that you can go forward without fear, let Him go. It doesn't matter what the preacher says if he works against the convicting Spirit of God. It's between you and God. The standard he'll call you to is higher than any man or woman can call you to. But I'm appealing to you. Let us rekindle our love for Jesus by spending time with him. Have a prayer life that will sustain you through the crisis. Know that God is real by letting him handle some of the many crises that will come. Some soon. So I'm appealing to you, wherever he's leading, follow. And whatever it costs, it's all cheap enough. Let's pray. Lord, 
You know, I chose that song because it speaks of blessed assurance. If we've got you, we can face life or death. Without you, Lord, we run. But I saw in that second verse, Lord, the story of Daniel, angels descending, bring from above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Old men should not be fed to lions. Neither should young men or babies. There are chapters in the history of this church which are terrible. Many through the years were fed to the lions. Lord, the devil goes about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and that's a metaphor, it's a symbol, it's an image. But when that was written, the author said, resist him. So as scary as the roar may be, and as fearful and foreboding as the path may look, when Jesus shows up, it's more than okay. May your peace reign in our hearts. May we not be afraid. I think of that Proverbs 31 woman. She's not afraid of foreboding for the future. Bless our mothers in Israel. Bless our fathers in Israel. Bless our brothers and sisters in Israel and our children. And may we do what you say with respect and dignity and humility. Bless us as we go forward, Lord. Protect this church from COVID as we work to protect ourselves. And may we be a part of those divine proportions you want us to assume. By your directive and your provision, I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I am the pastor, your broken record. Which means, I'm asking you please, when you leave this sanctuary today, dismiss from the back while a song is being sung, I'm asking you please to go out into the parking lot. Because while I believe there is a legitimate concern, you've heard me say in this message, fear is not to direct us, but we ought to have a healthy respect for what's going on. So I'm asking you, Please stay socially distanced unless you're in an uh, immunological bubble that you've created with family or friends. I'm asking you, wear the mask if you need to, and I'm asking you also to stay home if you're sick, okay? There's sanitizer on the way out, but please wait until you're dismissed by the deacons from the back. And God bless you on this Sabbath day with blessed assurance. As we're being dismissed, we'll sing Joy to the World.